many of the early colonists were displaced Englishmen and women who crossed the Atlantic with more than their personal belongings. They brought with them their millennial worldview also. Initially, the first eschatology that came to American shores was the English version of historicism. Postmillennialism, envisioned by Daniel Whitby, soon followed the colonial trail across the Atlantic in the first decades of the 18th century. Preachers like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, during the first Great Awakening, fanned the embers of postmillennialism into a raging fire of millennial optimism. The Second Great Awakening, through the preaching of men like Charles Finney, took postmillennial theory and married it to social activism. For the remainder of the 18th and 19th century, postmillennialism was dominant in the American religious mind. It is easy to think that the optimism preached by postmillennialism rang the death march for premillennialism, but this is not the case. English millennial historicism that first came to American shores did not die to the enthusiasm of postmillennialism, but it found root in smaller factions of American colonial society. Millennial historicism has one inherent weakness when compared with other eschatologies. This view can often paint itself into a corner by aligning current events with the symbols of revelation. Its own chronology of events can be their worst enemy. Historic theologians often hobble their expectations to their own static view of history and these expectations often result in millennial number crunching. Historic millennialists often step into the quicksand of the proverbial date-setting game. Probably the best known of the early colonists that preached an early form of premillennialism was Increase and Cotton Mather in the early 18th century. The father and son team wrote volumes about the destruction of the earth by fire and the removal of the saints from the earth. They wrote that the saints would be caught up into the air before the fiery destruction of the earth. We are now at the root of the rapture doctrine that would grow in popularity in the latter 19th century. Cotton Mather criticized the post-millennial preachers of his day that constantly wrote about an optimistic future. Cotton, in his writings, vividly described the total destruction preceding the second coming as God in an all-devouring rage. Initially, this theory caused both Increase and Cotton Mather scriptural contradiction. Would the saints of God endure such complete destruction? Their first attempt at solving this paradox was the idea of a partial destruction of the earth, with the saints hiding in safe secluded locations. But this theory didn't solve the contradiction of scripture. The only solution to their view of the end of the world was the rapture of the saints from the earth. From the writings of the Mather team, the rapture idea spread. The term rapture was first used by the English theologian Philip Doddridge in 1738 and John Gill, an English Baptist scholar, in 1748. But the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture was first articulated by Morgan Edwards, a Baptist preacher from Philadelphia in 1788, in his published essay under the edited title of Millennium, Last Novelties. The Disciples of Christ 
and Alexander Campbell of the Restorationist Movement were among those who carried premillennialism into the 19th century, while Joseph Smith and the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints later championed the doctrine. William Miller is probably the most famous and controversial premillennialist in the first half of the 19th century. He fell into the date-setting trap and caused a considerable stir in 1844 that became known as the Great Disappointment. Nearly all of these premillennialists on American shores up to this point were historicists. In 1790, another Jesuit carried forward the futurist theories of Franciscus Ribera, and his name was Manuel Lacunza, who wrote under the pen name of Rabbi Juan Jehoshaphat Ben Ezra. His work is entitled, The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty. The work of Ribera and Lacunza, along with the Jesuit bishop Robert Bellarmine, planted seeds of futurism that would produce fruit in 19th century England. Their writings succeeded in shifting Antichrist awareness away from the Pope to a future millennial age. Historic premillennialism of the 19th century seen in America also had an English variety that had a marginal degree of success. The chief proponents of this new version of premillennialism was Edward Irving and Henry Drummond in the 1820s and 30s. Edward Irving, a Scottish clergyman, was obsessed with the subject of prophecy. He based his belief in the imminent return of Jesus Christ on the writings of the Roman Catholic Jesuit Manuel Lacunza. In 1827, Irving translated Lacunza's writings from Spanish into English and arranged its publication. Irving drew large crowds with his preaching on end-time prophecy, and chief among his converts was Henry Drummond, who was a British banker and member of Parliament. The idea of a secret second coming was a doctrine taught by Manuel Lacunza, and Edward Irving introduced Lacunza's theory to John Nelson Darby at the Powers Court Conference in 1832. We now have a connection between Edward Irving and John Nelson Darby. Eventually, Edward Irving was excommunicated from the Presbyterian General Assembly of the Church of Scotland for preaching heresy concerning Jesus Christ having a sinful human nature. Edward Irving died on December 7, 1834, physically worn out and suffering from extreme emotional disturbance. Henry Drummond carried forward the vision of Edward Irving and organized his followers into the Catholic Apostolic Church. This group slipped further into prophetic charismatic extremes. By 1835, the movement officially organized under the leadership of 12 appointed apostles, and by 1836, they organized all of Christendom into 12 tribes, with an apostle for each apostolate. This was done in anticipation of the imminent return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom. The last apostle died in 1901. Edward Irving and Henry Drummond were classic premillennial historicists, but the next major change in premillennial doctrine would come from John Nelson Darby and the birth of dispensationalism. The birth of dispensationalism is shrouded in some mystery. There is historical evidence 
that futurism began in the 16th century with Franciscus Ribera, but an elementary form of dispensationalism can be traced to Giacomo Fiore and his three-age theory. Nearly all historians agree that systemized dispensationalism finds its root in the writings of John Nelson Darby of England. Darby was a disgruntled Anglican pastor from the Church of Ireland who broke away from his church to merge with a splinter group from Dublin that became known as the Plymouth Brethren. This group engaged in Pentecostal type worship and claimed apostolic authority. While part of the Plymouth Brethren, Darby formulated his dispensational eschatology. Darby followed his predecessors of Ribera and Lacunza and shifted the book of Revelation into the future. Darby's unique form of futurism did not fall into the same date-setting trap that historicism did. His theory of the millennium was no longer bound to historical and current events because he shifted the coming millennium to an unknown future date. Darby broke with traditional historicism and taught that nothing stood in the way of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Teaching on this subject proved to be one of his greatest contributions to premillennial doctrine. Darby also taught that God has dealt with humanity in a series of dispensations in which the means and mode of salvation varied. This is the crux of his teaching. Since Darby broke with historicism, he needed to reinterpret the book of Revelation. Therefore, he used the futurist system introduced by Ribera and shifted nearly all the book into a future prophetic seven-year period called the Tribulation. Darby's eschatology makes a sharp distinction between Israel and the church. He insisted that God formulated a different plan for each prophetic people, and the two plans would not mix. But this created a problem for Darby. How could God deal with his church and Israel at the same time? Darby had a paradox he needed to solve. Darby found his solution in the rapture doctrine fostered by increase in Cotton Mather. Darby would simply remove the church from the earth prior to the seven-year tribulation the secret rapture doctrine is one of the main points of futurist dispensationalism. Darby called the current church age the Great Parentheses because he viewed this dispensation as having no impact on God's prophetic picture. He wrote that God's prophetic time clock stopped with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and would commence again ticking with the rapture of the church. Darby's eschatology had one glaring problem. Israel did not exist as a nation. How could God deal with Israel when Israel did not exist? He taught that in order for the final dispensation to begin, God's chosen people needed to be restored to Palestine. Israel becoming a nation is the heart of Darby's eschatology. Between 1862 and 1877, Darby made five missionary journeys to North America. During these missionary excursions, Darby brought his unique form of eschatology and dispensationalism to the New World. 